In this there video, we're going to be making ferric chloride, which is ferric chloride hexahydrate. Along the way, of course, we'll be making ferrous chloride. Some information here, real basic. There's evidence that the ancient Egyptians knew how to make ferric chloride, and it was known to them as butter of iron. It was also used for a long time to treat wounds. Not today, of course, because it's an excellent blood coagulator. Today, it's primarily used as a circuit board etchant. Dissolves copper, which is most circuit boards have that. Also, it dissolves steel, iron, nickel, aluminum, and magnesium. So basically, throughout the experiment, you do not want to use metal utensils if you can avoid it. It will damage them. Ferric chloride hexahydrate is also known as a Lewis acid, meaning, just as a reminder, it accepts or donates a pair of electrons with Lewis bases. But the Lewis acids also cover all of the Bronsted-Lowry acids, like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, etc., because it is a Lewis acid, it forms colored complexes with phenols and alcohol. Some of the metals that ferric chloride dissolves react violently with the ferric chloride, and they are a short list, actually, sodium, aluminum, and magnesium. Sodium is by far the most reactive, and if you put anhydrous ferric chloride and sodium together, even though they're both dry, they'll react with a lot of heat, fire, and sparks. Also, heating ferric chloride, hexahydrate, eventually will give you crystals, but if you continue to heat it, you will not get anhydrous ferric chloride. If you heat ferric chloride enough, it will break down into hydrochloric gas, into ferric oxychloride, and into ferric oxide, not the anhydrous form. It's most easily made in an experimental situation at home, especially by dissolving iron or steel in hydrochloric acid, then adding hydrogen peroxide, and last but not least, ferric chloride is very hygroscopic. In case you can't imagine a brown puddle, I drew one there for you, because if you leave ferric chloride crystals out for very long at all, they'll absorb so much of the moisture, it will turn into just a brown puddle. In our materials, we'll need steel wool, 20 grams, 18.5% hydrochloric acid, 200 milliliters. I don't have that, so I'll need to make it. And then 3% hydrogen peroxide, 200 milliliters. The stoichiometry works out well because 20, 200, and 200 are all real easy to work with if you have the right percentages. Going over the reactions here, the first one will be the iron, which we talked about. We'll probably use steel wool plus the hydrochloric acid. Yields hydrogen gas and ferrous chloride, which is a greenish colored liquid. Then the ferrous chloride works with the hydrogen peroxide to produce the ferric chloride in water. You'll notice that the second reaction I just mentioned here is not balanced. It's actually impossible to balance it without including the first one. So the overall reaction for this particular experiment is two of the ferrous chloride plus the hydrogen peroxide plus two HCl yields two FeCl3 ferric chloride hexahydrate and two waters. And because ferric chloride does dissolve a couple of the metals I mentioned earlier, I'll go over those reactions real quick. Two different metals. First one is copper, which is used, according, of course, in etching circuit boards. So you have ferric chloride aqueous plus a solid copper yields ferrous chloride aqueous, and then copper one chloride, which falls out as a white precipitate. The second one is ferric chloride aqueous plus aluminum will yield plain old iron and then aluminum chloride and a lot of heat and sometimes flames. I think I might actually try this aluminum one. I'll see how it goes while doing the experiment. And finally, in our methods. So these are all the exact same uh, beaker. And uh, I'll start with the left here, of course. So we've got our steel wool on the bottom. We're adding our hydrochloric acid. And we can heat this up to 90 degrees Celsius because ferrous chloride doesn't break down until 105 degrees Celsius. I wrote that right down here, but I'm sure you can barely see it. So we can heat this to get it to dissolve no more than about 90 degrees Celsius. And then we need to let this cool down because when we add the hydrogen peroxide next, if this is above about 100 degrees Celsius, hydrogen peroxide will break down. When we add the hydrogen peroxide here, we'll get an immediate color change from the green ferrous chloride to the brown ferric chloride. And once we've added all of the hydrogen peroxide, we'll have 400 milliliters total in here, maybe a little more because the steel wool was uh, initially dissolved in there, but the 200 and the 200 milliliters from up here, of course, makes 400. And at this point, you could use this as a copper etchant, but I'm interested more in getting a concentrated solution in uh, some crystals later. So I'm gonna heat this. You can heat it up to 120 degrees. Um, ferric chloride breaks down at 150 degrees. So I wanna stay away from that completely, but you can heat this safely. And I found in doing this experiment before that once you get down to around 12 and percent of the original volume here, which turns out to be about 50 milliliters, maybe a little less of the 400, um, it will start to crystallize at that point. Now that's just bit personal experience. I can't guarantee that will happen every time. It might not even happen this time, but the 12 and percent seemed to be like the mark I was shooting for and it tended to to work. So once we have all of the uh, water out of here, we're going to then go ahead and chill it. 
So we get ferric chloride crystals here. After that, we'll filter them versus fast air drying. And what I mean by that is sometimes if these crystals are forming, we might still have some solution left and you just want to pour out the solution, take the crystals out and pat them dry and air dry them pretty quick. And again, you have to do that fast because it's very hygroscopic. So whatever you do, where you have to get these crystals into a container where no moisture can get into. So fast air drying, dry quick whatever you do, seal whatever it is immediately so the moisture doesn't get in. And then finally, I'm going to test the ferric chloride with copper. I said maybe aluminum, maybe magnesium, which will be more reactive. I'll just see how the experiment goes. Okay, that's it. No more to talk about. Let's go make our ferric chloride hexahydrate. The type of steel wool I'll be using, but before we start, I'm going to do something I haven't done in a very long time. All right, I'm done playing around. As we saw, I need 200 milliliters of 18.5% hydrochloric acid. I have a liter of 31% hydrochloric acid, and I'm gonna use, once again, this equation. I know this might get boring, but I'm gonna do it when I can just to show how this works out. This time I'll write it out as I go. So we have the first concentration, we'll use 18 and a half, which has an actual number is 0 0.185. And we're gonna multiply that by 200 milliliters. That's how much we want. Just put a 200 there. And that, of course, is equal to the second concentration we have at 31%, which is 0 0.31. And we don't know how much of that we need. We have a liter, but it's unknown the exact amount, so we'll call that X. In rearranging this, we have X equals 0 0.185 times 200 divided by 0 0.31. And if we solve for this, which of course I did beforehand, I'm not that smart, it's 119 milliliters. So we know we need 119 milliliters of the 31% right here and the rest of course to get to the 200 that we need up here uh, what we'll do is add water so we'll take the 200 minus 119 Before I mix this very basic solution right here, I want to go over a couple things. So I have 31% hydrochloric acid right here. There's 100 milliliters, and there's 19 in here that I need to add to make it 119. But right now, this hydrochloric acid is forming in equilibrium with the surface and the air above it, fine particles of hydrochloric acid that have escaped out of the solution and are producing fumes. And anybody who's worked with hydrochloric acid knows if you first open it, uh, up or even after as long as the humidity in the air is high enough you see fumes and that's because above this are the fumes of hydrochloric acid when they mix with the water it produces actual hydrochloric acid which are wafting off as fumes so number one don't breathe it in of course you breathe it in hydrochloric acid uh, but number two always be careful that you don't mix these solutions too quickly because you could get a lot of this at one time and at that point it might be unavoidable but to breathe some in. So I'm just going to add the 19 milliliters here to make it 119 milliliters of 31% hydrochloric acid. Now I'm going to add the distilled water here to this column which I used to measure the original 100 milliliters that was in there. So there's hydrochloric acid in here and if you see it looks a little cloudy and that's because those fumes have started and as I fill this up with water you'll see new ones formed and the one that's in there, meaning the fumes of hydrochloric acid will come out the top uh, as a form of what looks like steam, but it's not. Those are actually hydrochloric acid molecules in the form of a vapor. Okay, I measured the top of this tape, which I put exactly at 81. So I'm just gonna add the water here, also slowly, because this is exothermic. It doesn't have to be too slow, not like uh, with sulfuric acid, where it will literally start to boil in front of you. Okay, 200 milliliters of 18.5% hydrochloric acid. We can now move on to the next step. 20 grams of very fine steel wool pre-weighed. 200 milliliters of 18.5% hydrochloric acid that we talked about ad nauseum, but it's still pre-measured. 200 milliliters of 3% hydrogen peroxide pre-measured. I want to get the steel wool as far down into the beaker as I can because we're only using 200 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. So I'm going to chop it up into smaller pieces here to hopefully do that. I'm not sure how well this will work, and this is easy to do with a pair of scissors, so... This is what I'm gonna do. It looks like a pretty big pile right now, but I think when I crush it down in the beaker, actually, this is gonna work okay. Well, I came pretty close. Uh, it's right at 200 for most of the way around here, um, but yeah, look at the magnetic stirrer I put in there. It's grabbing everything. Uh, we'll see if that even works, but okay. 
let's add the acid. Uh, but first, I got to do this to make sure we get all 20 grams here. All right, there we go. All right, the first thing we're going to do is add our hydrochloric acid to this. It will immediately start breaking it down, even though this is just at room temperature. Lastly, hydrogen is being formed here, so you want to do this outside or have a fume hood uh, because quite a, bit of it, quite a bit of it is formed when um, it's heated. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on the magnetic stir here. It doesn't probably going to do anything right now, but that's okay. And turn up the temperature, and we'll be back. The last thing I'm going to do here is put this glass dish here on the top just to hold as much of the uh, fumes and liquid in there as I can. It's been about 20 minutes, and I'd say almost three quarters of this has been dissolved. The heat really helps it dissolve quicker. But you'll notice in the upper left corner where the spout of the beaker is coming out a little bit there, you, you can see sort of a white stream, and it's a perfect stream of hydrogen that's been being released uh, into the fume hood. Also, the beaker is full of it because it's been capped a little bit. Just something to be aware of uh, and to be careful. It's almost all done dissolving. Small particles are adhering to the magnetic stir in the middle, but those will dissolve in uh, no problem when we add the hydrogen peroxide. So I'm going to take off the top of this right here. We don't really have any hydrogen gas being formed anymore, and it looks like we're still at 200 milliliters, which is great. Turn down the magnetic stir and the heat. Okay, be back when it's cooled down so we can add the hydrogen peroxide. It only took about an hour, but this is cooled down now to room temperature. I'm going to turn the magnetic stirrer back on here before we start adding the hydrogen peroxide. When I add the hydrogen peroxide, there's going to be an immediate color change as the ferric chloride is formed from the ferrous chloride. Also, there might be some fizzing. There's still some free iron um, pieces in there, and the ions from that free iron will cause some fizzing, which is a release of oxygen gas from the breakdown of the hydrogen peroxide. It's not a lot. It'll get better as it goes on. And we also want to keep this below about 60 degrees Celsius because that will also break down hydrogen peroxide, but it'll do it thermally. So we're going to put a, uh, what do you call it in here, thermometer, and uh, we'll be checking that closely. All right. Adding the hydrogen peroxide, forever changing the color. See some of the fizzing, which is the oxygen bubbles. And so here's our ferric chloride solution. Pretty simple exercise, really. Uh, the temperature got up to around 36 degrees Celsius, and it's already starting to come down, so no problem with the temperature whatsoever. I am going to let it mix for maybe another 10, 15 minutes. Then I'm going to take a little bit poured aside, but a majority of this, as I said earlier, I'm going to try to crystallize it into a solid fair chloride. I'll let it mix for about 10 minutes here and turn off the magnetic stirrer. Of course, there's not been heat on at all. And I'm going to save about 100 milliliters of the liquid here, fair chloride, to uh, experiment with a little bit later. And the rest, I'm going to cook, put right back on and start to heat it to drive off as much water as I can. Fair chloride will completely break down at around 315 degrees Celsius, but it starts to break down around 150 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to turn the temperature up here, but I'll keep it somewhere between 110 and 120, and we'll start the magnetic stir uh, once more. We want to get this down to about 12.5% of its total volume. I've done this a couple times, and that's right around where it starts to uh, be thick enough so that when you chill it, it does turn into a crystal. All right, we're starting to heat it. Let's go. I started to time lapse this. But after a half hour here, there's only 25 milliliters uh, evaporate approximately, and that's just going to be a lot of time and memory. So I'm going to just come back periodically to check on it. It's been an hour since I last checked this. We're at 200 milliliters, and the temperature remains the same right around 95, 92 to 95 degrees Celsius. I tried to heat it up more, but it doesn't want to go up that much more, so I'm going to leave it right there. It's been another hour. There's about 100 milliliters left there, and the temperature's gone up a little bit, about 5 degrees, because there's obviously less liquid to heat there. So you can see nothing's heated and there's no thermometer in there. And that's because last night I was getting late. I had heated it down to 100 milliliters and I'm like, I can finish this tomorrow. So I'm back here tomorrow. What happened overnight was our temperatures were in the 60s. They dropped into the 30s. So today I come out, my lab is in the garage, totally affected by the temperatures. And I turn on the magnetic stir and it's bouncing like, just like crazy. So I looked in here and look what happened overnight these unbelievably nice ferric chloride crystals formed. And the reason I'm showing them to you now is because I've done this before a couple times and they have never come out this clean and pure. So I'm gonna stop this. You can see where the magnetic stir was spinning there, but, um, and dump this into the liquid into another container 
and then take those crystals out and I'm gonna dry them. Then take the remaining liquid and start to heat it again. I have about a 100 milliliter beaker. I'm gonna pour the liquid into here. The main reason I'm doing this is I'm concerned that if I heat this, I'll destroy the crystals that are in there. And in the end, I'll end up with crystals that are less desirable like I've gotten before. The stuff is pretty syrupy. Let's set that aside. So here are the crystals in there. I'm just gonna get those out and dry them. I'm not gonna bother you with a video about it. It's pretty straightforward. I'll show them to you later again, but we'll take this. I'll probably put it back into this beaker when I'm done and heat it some more. This is the same 500 milliliter beaker. I'm gonna pour this liquid right back in there and start to heat it some more. So originally I said 12 and a half percent and that's because that's what I had found to get crystals, but they're not nearly as clean. So I'm gonna take some of that back. It looks like uh, maybe 20% of the original fluid or somewhere between 15 and 20% is enough. So I'm going to turn on the magnetic stir here in the heat. It's been about an hour and a half and uh, this boiled down nicely. The temperature was maintained well, uh, actually below 100 Celsius. So I'm going to take the thermometer out here, but I want you to notice if you look at the side of the beaker there, it looks like we're at about 50 milliliters, but the whole thing is deceptive. It's really not at 50. I'm going to turn off the magnetic stir in the heat here. Now this is very hot. It's about 90 degrees Celsius and it's still starting to crystallize there. So I'm pretty confident if I stop here and chill this, we're gonna get a solid. This is cooled down to room temperature right now. And check this out. One solid chunk of crystals there. They are much finer than the ones I took out earlier, but yep, that's one solid crystal mass. I don't even think it, there's any liquid in there at all. So um, take the 12 and a half percent I said earlier and kind of impressed upon you uh, with a big grain of salt. It's, n it's obviously not gonna be correct all the time. I'm not sure why it was different now, but I'd say anything less than 20% of the original liquid will produce crystallization. I want to take just a minute and show you how I preserved these crystals we took out first. So it's been three days since I took them out. On the bottom here, I have a bunch of those little packets that uh, absorb moisture that you can see in food. I've just saved them over time. And then on a plastic lid, I put these crystals with a nice lid on top that I know secures well, and it's working really well. These are ferrous chloride crystals. I grabbed them from an earlier experiment I did. I was making ferric chloride, but I actually took some of the ferrous chloride and crystallized it. And this is ferrous chloride, hexa, or, I'm sorry, tetrahydrate. So there's four waters attached to each one of the uh, ferrous chloride complexes. Um, it is also hygroscopic, so I have to be careful not to leave it out here too long. And then over on the right here, these are the ferric chloride crystals I took out, which like I said earlier, are some of the most beautiful crystals. They are for ferric chloride. For me so this is fair chloride hexahydrate and of course this and this will start to turn into puddles if i don't put them away soon this is that second batch of crystals where basically i left it on the heat until all the water evaporated and you can see there kind of has a motley appearance there um, these i'm going to just chip up and save to be mixed with water in the future to have a fair chloride solution but that's it if you remember earlier i poured off 100 milliliters of the 400 milliliters of ferric chloride and set it aside so i took some of the 100 milliliters and poured it into this 100 milliliter beaker about maybe 20 and then i put a piece of copper piping in there just a bent up old piece of copper piping and i just want to show you what's happened overnight i did this yesterday and you can see um a lot of a mess really is what you see but the white is the um, copper one chloride that's formed it's also formed in the solution which is why it kind of looks so muddy and brown and ferrous chloride also produced in the solution but because of the muddy brown you can't really see it but i do want to pull this piece of copper out here so you can see it there we go so it's kind of built up on the end here uh it's you can't really see where it would eat away i'm sure if i cleaned it up you could see it ate into the copper of course um but yeah this is why Ferric chloride is used as an etchant and why it works so well. Here's some 30 milliliters from the original 100 milliliters I set aside. Uh, we already tested copper. This is a fresh batch. Made a little boat here out of aluminum. See that right there? Yeah, okay. It's not a very expensive one, but we'll drop our aluminum boat in here. Well, in an ocean of ferric chloride, don't build your boats out of aluminum.